Allah Rahman Rahim. Assalamu alaikum. What I had in mind was to uh, just make one other approach to uh, the kind of material that uh, I tried to discuss in uh, many places and under uh, many different circumstances. And one way of presenting uh, Islam is to present it, through, and we're following the uh, example of uh, set up uh, in the Quran present it as though it was a legal case, that is to uh, establish uh, Islam as though we were both in the position of being under uh, prosecution, so we defend ourselves and to prosecute our case. As uh, we're told uh, in particular, the one I is talking about a discussion with people of the book, but the principle is sound, that um, we are supposed to present Islam according to the best means, and it is uh, it's different from second to second. I don't know what to, if you can hear me, I'll turn it off. Uh, because it's very distracting, uh, I'm sure. Okay, can you manage like that? Can you hear me all right? All right. Uh, one uh, reason why court systems are set up as they are set up is because uh, people have in mind that we're going to arrive at the truth because we have eliminated all of the things that would lead us uh, in the wrong direction. We have a legal proceeding because we present evidence and we discuss it uh, and judge it according to its value and everybody has to keep quiet until uh, each side has presented his case. Uh, so if we can imitate that proceeding and talk about Islam in that way, this could be uh, possibly the best way of uh, giving the explanation. You see, if, we, if you can keep it down, thank you. <laughs> I appreciate it. It's not necessary to get the maximum volume out of it. Just sufficient volume will be enough. Okay. Now, there are some things in... Uh, that we can take it from a position, first of all, as being on the defensive. That is, when people question the Muslim, what is your defense? Imagine yourself uh, on uh, the witness stand and somebody is prosecuting his case. You have to defend yourself. There are a number of things that will be directed toward you that you have to be equipped to uh, respond to. One of these is what I call the cheap arguments. That is, there are things that are said about Muslims which are cheap in that sensible people deserve better. When people say things about Islam which they've been saying for hundreds of years, they've been answered also for hundreds of years, and still they say them, these are cheap arguments. That is, a worthy man knows better, he wouldn't use them. But some people still use them. So that's one category of things that you have to meet by way of defense, to point out to people, that argument is cheap, because you've had your answer for hundreds of years and still you use it. Uh, there's many examples of this. Uh, maybe I mention one or the other here, but, uh, and you can come back to it later. But there are many, many cases of this. In fact, um, I have often had it happen where people ask a question about Islam and they, uh, they want to know, do you have the answer? They ask me, to which I've told them, you'll find the answer to that question in the same place you found the question. They found it in some old book. They found it possibly in Tafsir. That is a tactic some people use. They research Islam until they find some point they think most Muslims don't know, and then they challenge them with that, hoping they don't know the answer. You see, it doesn't seem to matter to them that there is an answer. They're in possession of that. Somebody only told me a few days ago, when I was in the UK, about a missionary who had gone to India, and he asked a question, and no one in the community could answer. He was challenging the Muslims. No one could answer until a man came from a neighboring community. He gave the answer to that question. The missionary left. He went to East Africa. He started asking the same question again. The Muslims there didn't know the answer. They started writing letters. And as it happened, a letter, they were asking people about this matter, a letter found its way back to this village where the missionary had been before. A group of people got together and they sent the man who answered him to East Africa. He approached the man then one day when he was offering this challenge to the Muslims, and as soon as the missionary recognized him, that was the end of the discussion, he left that country. So you see, there are people who don't care if you have the answer. What they care about is causing a problem. That's what I mean by cheap argument. An example of that is, as recently as last November, somebody handed in a question to me, 
As it happens, he's a, a cop from Sudan who is paid by a missionary group, the Fellowship of Faith in Toronto, uh, to come and <laughs> cause problems. He suggested that in the Quran, Maryam, the mother of Isa, is confused with Miriam, the sister of Harun. As the Bible tells us, Harun, Musa, and Miriam were a family, brothers and a sister. And in the Quran, it talks about Maryam as being a sister of Aaron, Harun. That's an argument that's 14 centuries old. Muslims have pointed out for 14 centuries that there's many explanations for this, one of which is that when you use the expression in Arabic, you can be talking about someone as part of a family, not literally a sister, anyone who comes from that family line. Well, that's been said for many centuries, but people would still insist, some do, they say, no, it's literal, somebody made a mistake. You mixed up two people that lived hundreds of years apart, Mariam and Miriam. Well, if they were really honest about that kind of thing, they'd have to face what they have on their own hands. In the Bible, Luke chapter 1, verse 5, it talks about the mother of Yahya, Elizabeth, and it says she was a daughter of Aaron. If you point that out to the missionary, he'll tell you, no, no, when we say daughter, we mean a member of the family. We don't mean really a daughter. But when you say sister, you mean really a sister. That's what I mean by a cheap argument. It doesn't matter that that has been replied to satisfactorily for hundreds of years. It keeps showing up in books. So some people don't care of the accuracy of things. They have a case that they're after. There are uh, another type of thing that you may be uh, prosecuted with. There are poorly thought out arguments. That is, they are things people say, but they haven't thought about the finish of what they have started. That is... For an example, of people who have often said that to me, uh, the problem with you Muslims is, you don't know God. To which I always have to ask them, well, what do you mean, know God? You know God? How do you know him? To which they will say, well, once God became a man, that's how we know him, he walked among us. So I always ask them, did you meet him? Until you know, but we have a book that reports everything he said and did, so we know him. To which I have always pointed out, well, I've read the same book several times. If this is God, I know him as well as you. I've read the same word you read. No, no, no. I don't mean I know God, I mean I know God. It becomes something he can't tell me now. When you ask him, what do you mean you know him, he tells you that's that's... Uh, the knowledge, I'll quote you a verse from one of Paul's letters that says, this is the knowledge that surpasses all understanding. So I can't even put it into words for you. I mean, I know God. It's not know like the dictionary says, no, like I met him or I read about him. I know him in here. I can't tell you about it. So, again, we're following the Quranic principle, which uh, occurs in so many places that... Uh, reduces to uh, to this, or an aspect of it reduces to this, that people can say what they like, but they should be made to say what they mean when they say it. Don't just say it, what do you mean? Or finish what you said. If you say that, do you mean this, or do you mean that? Because that has always been the best reply of people who have been approached by uh, individuals, whether they came with a philosophy or religion or politics, if they told people what you ought to do is be part of this thing because, and now the words become kind of vague, we do best to tell them, wait, you used this word, that word, tell me, what do you mean when you say that? Now, if the Muslim would insist on that, of telling people, say what you like, but say what you mean, sometimes that is reversed, and people will try to put that back on the Muslim. Don't be fooled by this tactic when it is used unnecessarily. That is, you can be speaking perfectly clearly, and somebody asks you, what do you mean? You want to remind him that you have been speaking clearly. In other words, he'll try to make work for you where no work exists. I just had that happen in, uh, in Newcastle just a few days ago in England. Where a man is asking me about good and bad and so on, I said a man has it in front of him, the good and the bad. He can choose good, he could choose bad. 
The man says, yes, but how do you choose? I know what the word choose means. So is anybody else who's listening to me, I hope. But what he wants me to do is say, yes, choose, that's a very big subject, and get confused when I try and explain it. I know what choose means. I have two things. I chose this or I chose that one. So don't be fooled by that tactic. If somebody has not made himself clear, point that out to him. But if you are making yourself clear, don't let somebody tell you that you're not, if you really are making yourself clear. In fact, I usually answer to questions like that. I just ask them, didn't you understand the word? You tell me what's difficult to understand about that word. Give him back the job he was hoping to give you. Now, there's different sorts of people that may challenge uh, the Muslim for taking the positions that he does. Some of them may be irreligious. They are people who, probably for good reason, don't like religion. They've been disappointed in what they have seen of religion. And so uh, the accusation might be that, uh, well, yours is just another religion. I've examined religions, and they are none of them any good. Yours is just another one. But you want to ask a man to make sure of that, to ask him exactly what is it you find in my religion that parallels other religions. Usually they'll tell you, but carelessly enough, they'll say, well, it's like all religions, it's built on superstition. Things that we know better than. It's something left over from primitive man before he uh, came into possession of knowledge. You want to challenge people on that, to ask them, where is superstition in the Quran? Where is the unreasonable? There are those who might try to confuse that very issue on the religious side because they will tell you uh, that somehow what they have is not superstition and what you have is superstition. But again, ask for people to spell out the details. What is there that sounds like folklore, if you will, or mythology in the Quran? You have stories, rehearsals of historical events. What is there that sounds like the kinds of stories that people tell in mythology? There's a lot of that in the Bible. You find in the Psalms, in the book of Job, it tells you how did the world come to be? God had to fight with a dragon first. Rahab. That sounds like something out of mythology. There's nothing like that in Islam. We don't have battles between gods and goddesses and sons of gods and dragons and so on. And somehow when the insides of a dragon are ripped out this became the earth and uh, and all these sorts of stories that is superstition that's not a part of the quran it sets out a sequence of events stages by which the world came to be but not according to a story that has these elements that uh, come out of mythology it also should be noted that if people would accuse islam of being somehow primitive or uh, it's not progressive that they should take note of the educational method of the Quran. How does the Quran educate us? It does not do, as a lot of people are doing, for example, across the United States now, they have a great many churches who, they are so afraid of what the public school system will tell their children that they build their own schools and they put the children in there and they teach them only what they want them to hear. Anything that they don't like, that is eliminated. The books are censored or they don't even come into the school grounds. They teach them just what they wanted them to hear. Is that education? Is that how the Quran educates us? Well, not at all. The Quran quotes every silly thing anybody ever said. 332 times they say such and such. It doesn't shelter us from anything. The most outrageous and ridiculous things that people ever said, they're quoted for us in the Quran so that we can be shown the value of this. They say this, but do they know that? Have they forgotten such and such? That's how you really educate people. You show them everything. You don't hide something from them because you're afraid they're going to uh, go astray somehow. Show them everything, but put it in its place according to value. That's how education used to work. It doesn't work that way now even in the public school system. You get up into universities, in North America at least, 
And the idea is you put everything in front of somebody and you make no judgment on any of it. If you've got ten ideas and somebody comes with idea number eleven, put it alongside the rest of these. You do not grade anything. That leaves that to the student. Make up his own mind. In fact, he's encouraged not to make up his mind. Just to remember, well, all of these are things people say. But real education, uh, even in the English, it, it has to do with leading out of things, is supposed to guide you through what is valuable. Make a note of this, it's not worth much. Well, throw it over here. This is good, keep it. Put it in this department, or compartment. That's real education, and that's the Quranic method. Take the valuable, set aside those things that don't deserve your attention. In fact, we can use any educational program. I often tell Muslims who worry a great deal about their children in public schools, it doesn't really matter which school they go to. All you have to do is ask them every day what they tell you in school today. Then ask them to think about it. How valuable was that? What do you make of it? Now, of course, on the other hand, as I've said, these are irreligious people may attack the Muslim position saying, you see, you people are primitive, you're superstitious or whatever. The religious who would oppose the Muslim uh, do the opposite. Uh, they would insist on a superstition. I say, what's wrong with you people is you haven't carried over this. You've been too cold and calculating and you've just stuck to bare facts. You have to realize religion involves this and this and so on. And they would heap on us the superstition. So it is that, in particular, the Quran makes some of these things clear that they are nothing but superstitions. It's a very firm pronouncement, over and over, the firm pronouncement, uh, Allah does not adopt nor beget a son. He doesn't have offspring, however you want to view it. Adoption, begetting, whatever process you think it was, there's no such thing as a son of God in any real sense, according to the Quran. But that's not a command in the Quran. It doesn't command Muslims, believe that. It's an objection. It's a thing that's exhibited. It tells you why. Maybe we can come back to that, but it gives you reasons why it isn't so. It doesn't just demand that you not believe it. It doesn't rob you of a superstition. It identifies it as a superstition. Just recently in uh, Dublin, Ireland, uh, a priest stood up after a, a lecture I'd given there, and he started off by introducing himself, and he told everyone, he said, I'm an expert on Islam. He said, I've been studying Islam for many years, only this afternoon I gave a lecture on Islam. And then he went on to show how little he knew about it. He said, you should make it clear that uh, we are in total agreement with Muslims. When you say God is one, we say the same thing, because that means there's only one God. Not what we believe, it's what you believe. So, I pointed out to him that Allahu Wahid, if you like to say God is one, can have a wide range of meanings and does. One of which he'd obviously overlooked because the priest who just spoken before him had contradicted the, the very point that when you say something is one, you mean it is an undivided whole. It's completely what it is. As the example I gave, I said, Einstein had said at one time, he said, security is one. What he was getting at was it's rather meaningless to say, I am secure, except for that. That could be dangerous. Well, then you're not secure. You either are or you are not. Security is one. It doesn't come in pieces, so you can be 90%. You are secure or you are not secure. So when the Muslim says God is one, he means he is 100% godly. He's not divine and godly 99% and there is this about him which is not exactly godly. No, God is one or he isn't God. Because the priest who had just spoken before him had pointed out that there is one God and he's divine, but he is also something less than divine, he is man. That's not God by definition. When I say God, I say Allah, he's one, he's 100% who he is. He's not in part something less than what he is. That's not God anymore. We're talking about something else. The Quran insists God has no offspring, whether adopted or begotten, for the simple reason that divinity, the quality of being godly, is a quality that you don't achieve or produce by definition. 
You can't be something else and then get godliness. Or it can't be the case that there wasn't this godly item and then it was brought forward because what is divine is not produced. Who is divine didn't gain that position. Being divine, who is divine has always been divine. Now when such things are discussed often, the usual response is, again I'm saying the Muslim is on the defensive, people will say, yes, but you know logic has its limits. That's an excuse that people use. It's true, logic has its limits. It uh, shocked the uh, world of uh, uh, logic and uh, mathematicians in general, 1931, when a, a proof was presented, it's called, after the man who uh, composed it, uh, Gerdell, Gerdell's proof, they pointed out that yes, logic does not have the answer to everything. There are some questions logic cannot touch. That if that were not so, logic would collapse. There have to be some things logic can't touch. So people get a hold of a little corner that they heard that somewhere, and so they tell you, you see, logic has limits. Yes, it has limits. But do those limits have anything to do with the questions we're talking about? That's something they haven't thought about. You see, this is like a man complaining, uh, uh, he has a pocket calculator, and he says, look, I can only put eight digits on here. How am I supposed to keep track of my bank account? I don't need eight digits for my bank account. Probably most of us don't. The pocket calculator probably keeps track of all the money we have in the bank. So it's not a real objection to say logic has limits, but then to point out, but the questions we're talking about don't come anywhere near those limits is not an excuse. There are also those who would say reasoning in general, they say reasoning can be deceptive. On the one hand, if what they mean is a man who gives you an argument might deceive you, yes. I'd agree. There are some, some things that sound very nice, they could fool you. How do you keep from being fooled? You become reasonable. You overturn the false argument by being reasonable. So the truth of the matter is, sound reasoning is not deceptive. If someone wants to insist that that is true, that a perfect argument with no fault in it can still tell you a lie, you want to ask him for proof of that. He's insisting that something is true and if he tells you he can prove it, you want to remind him, no, no, you told me any proof can fool you. So don't tell me you can prove it. So actually, whether a person is religious or irreligious, if he is pushing against the Muslim position on various grounds, the Muslim's response actually shows him that there are some difficulties that he hasn't faced. Because really what is done when people try to prosecute uh, the Muslim is that they only offer challenges and uh, suggestions. They're saying, well, maybe this, or couldn't it be that? They suggest things, but they don't give you an objection that stands. They make a suggestion, and you can point out that at most that is a suggestion. You haven't given me a solid thing. You've told me a thing that might be. And in most cases, I've showed you it can't be anyway. So they don't leave you with an objection so much as a, an excuse. That is, they have uh, said, well, maybe this, and that's all I need to tell you. As it happens now, when we turn around the other way, if the Muslim would prosecute his case to try to challenge people to say, what do you say of this? The Quran assures us that if we'll follow the advice given, if we bring forth the questions that are in this book, that they are going to be left without excuse. As an ayah specifically mentions, they, unbelievers, are without excuse. And there's many ways, uh, many things that should be brought to their attention by way of prosecution. I can sort of start where I, I finished, <laughs> in that when people normally make progress in investigating anything when they're trying to figure out a system, is a theory sensible, if it's science, medicine, whatever they're examining, they press on with their uh, reasoning, giving things thought, but if they come to something that's impossible, that is, their reasoning leads them to a contradiction, an absurdity, then they realize, well, there's something wrong with where I started then. That when you find a paradox, it means there was something wrong with what you assumed in the first place. 
That's how you make progress. When you reach a point where there's no sense here, then, well, something's wrong, I have to start over. I made a mistake in what I assumed. This is the method that has been around over the centuries. One famous man, 17 centuries ago, Arius, offered it as an argument. He pointed out, divinity means immortality. So he said, you want to point to someone and say he's God and he's man? And he, his example went something like this. He said of Jesus, if he was God, he didn't die. If he died, he wasn't God. So that in all generosity, I suppose the, the Muslim could come that far to say to uh, the Christian who would insist that Jesus is both, to say, if you want to say Jesus was God, go ahead. But then don't tell me he died. If you want to tell me Jesus died, go ahead. But then don't tell me he was God. For today, you can have either one. But certainly you can't have both. That's an old argument, until now it doesn't have an answer, it just has a name. They named it after Arius. So that's the Arian syllogism. It doesn't make it go away. There are those who, however, rejoice in the paradox. That is, when they find the impossible thing, that becomes a thing to be happy about. Another man, 17 centuries ago, said, It is absurd, therefore I believe it. That's how his religion worked. He said, when I reach a stupid thing, I know it's true. That's my religion. Augustine and Tertullian of the fourth century were of that frame of mind. It is absurd, therefore I believe it. But you see the problem that a person is in if he believes what doesn't make sense. How does he choose between the competing bits of nonsense? In other words, I can tell you something that doesn't make sense, and he can tell you something else that doesn't make sense. And they're different. How do you choose which one? What standards do you use to judge between brands of nonsense? You see, the only thing you can judge between is sense. You can discern the sense from the nonsense. But there's no standard by which to say, that is more silly than that, I guess, or <laughs> so I'll choose the more silly, or whatever. There's no systematic way of reviewing it. If something is absurd, it makes no kind of sense. How do you give it a value? It's also a realistic uh, fact, I mean, it is, uh, what people should face is that the human mind can't rest on uncertainty anyway. That is, if somebody has been faced with an impossibility, if he makes as an excuse, well, how can I decide anyway I can't figure things out. Your mind won't let you stop there. The human mind can't stop on a place that is unbalanced. It has to roll one direction or the other. It has to go someplace. You can't say, I don't know, and stop. Your mind won't let you do that. It has to seek rest someplace, comfort. Otherwise, it's disturbed. So where do people stop? Well, some people, interestingly enough, they stop on uncertainty as a principle. They say, I can't be sure of these things. In fact, I know that for sure. That I'm never going to be sure of anything. And he stops there. He makes uncertainty the one thing he's sure of. Which, of course, is a dead end. Your mind is still not going to rest. Your mind is still going to be causing you trouble. There's a famous American evangelist who said that when he was a young man and starting out his preaching career, Every time he thought about Trinity, his head hurt. He said, around the back. And the pain would get so intense that he couldn't stand up. So one night he was sitting at a campfire, a group of people in a, on a picnic, and he got up and he went into the woods, he got down on his knees, he promised God, I'll never think about Trinity again. He said, the headache went away. Never thought about it again, never worried about it. Well, something has been disconnected you can do that. You can stop and then disconnect the alarm system that tells you, no, you should still be worried. But what have you done to the mind then? Just as you could go to an elaborate computer system and uh, go around the back and pull one little wire out, maybe, the thing will still work most of the time. But every once in a while it will 
throw out some garbage to you. Because when it has to pass through the circuit you disconnected, garbage comes out. Garbage in, garbage out, I guess is the saying that they say. You can do the same thing with your brain. You can disconnect one circuit, the alarm that tells you when something doesn't make sense. And you get through life, but from time to time, you won't process information properly and you'll say something foolish. Some examples of that uh, in a, a moment or so. Or, if people are uncertain, if they don't stop on a principle of uncertainty itself, where else can they stop? Sometimes they stop on their feelings. I tell you, all right, I don't have proof about the things I claim, but I feel they're true. They stop on their feelings. Now to this, a Muslim wants to remind a man, are you trusting what you feel is the case, mankind? <laughs> you who, when you were a child, were afraid of the dark. You who, as an adult, maybe, will scream at the sight of a spider when you know it can't hurt you, and so on. To remind a man that just how safe a guide is your feelings. You used to be afraid of the dark for no reason. You may still be afraid of some things for no reason. That same faculty, you're going to trust that to deliver the truth to you? How do you know this certainty is any more sensible, any more true than the fact that an insignificant little spider that you could reach out and swat, you run from it? Now, some people do. They're terrified of them. It doesn't make sense, but look at the influence it has on you. Are you going to use that same faculty to judge truth? Because the Muslim, on the other hand, is trying to point out that he is looking for truth. The Muslim says, I am looking for truth, and I know what it is when I find it. How do you recognize it when you find it? You see, the Muslim has a list of standards. He says truth has to fit facts, for example. It has to be coherent. It can't conflict with itself. He has standards like that, so when he meets something that fits the facts and makes perfect sense that he can verify, he recognizes, oh, this is truth. If a person doesn't use that standard, if he said, no, no, the brain is dangerous, it'll lead me astray, how does he know truth when he finds it? By what standard? How does he tell you, I know this is true and that's false, because why? He feels it. And I say the Muslim is examining the the facts of things, and in uncovering the facts, facts are our friends, they are our ally. History is our ally, it's not our opponent. Whereas, when people have decided on something that makes no sense, the facts cause them problems. There's a thing you'll see in some offices, in the U.S. especially, it caught on like a fad, it's a little card or they'll print it up like a, a frame it about that big people hang it in their offices it's a famous saying now which says my mind is made up don't confuse me with the facts that's a way of life for some people they decided and now they tell you but any facts you bring me those only cause trouble they've just confused me i made up my mind don't bring me the facts it's supposed to work the other way when you have seen the facts, you make up your mind. It's supposed to be how the process works. Facts are not supposed to cause you trouble. As I say, history is our ally. That's, a, that's another subject, but primarily, I suppose, the example the Muslim is faced with all the time is on, uh, uh, that is, in, in places where the, the missionary activity is crowding the Muslim or where the Muslim finds himself in a, a, an environment uh, where the church singles him out as a target, as Muslim students abroad, the main issue uh, concerns Jesus and who was he? History is our friend. Their own sources are our friends. The Quran says, unless they stand fast by the Torah and the Injil, they have nothing. That's our friend. That's not our opponent. The history they read in their own books will point out to them that claiming equality with God was what people said Jesus did. It was not something he ever endorsed. Even as the Bible tells the story, when the Jews became angry with him, and he asked, why are you angry with me? They said, you claimed equality with God. He did not say, you're right, that's what I did, I'm sorry it makes you angry. He didn't do that. In fact, as it's reported, he tried to tell them, well, you didn't hear what I said then, and corrected them by showing them what he said was perfectly harmless. He tricked them, he riddled with them. 
Imagine this, if you can. A friend of mine has it on, on tape. <laughs> His Yugoslavian brother lives in Toronto. He's always videotaping religious programs because I, I don't know if he has in his mind, maybe on the judgment day, someone's going to ask him for the videotapes. Uh, so he, he has proof these men said what, what <laughs> these things. And he has on one of his videotapes one of the men who was a, a Bible translator. He translated the New King James Version. A lot of publicity about this the last few years. He was interviewed on a television program and they asked him about uh, was it hard work and so on and so forth. And he, if you can believe your ears, his statement was that when they were doing the translation he said, and I quote, we had to sacrifice accuracy for the sake of understanding. Do we teach any subject like that? We'll be a little less accurate, they will understand it better. If you're sacrificing accuracy for the sake of understanding, what you really mean is you want people to understand something in particular, so you're a little less accurate to make sure they understand what you had in mind. That accuracy, the facts, are your opponent. Maybe I'll come back to this in a, in a moment. It uh, relates to a number of interesting stories. The Quranic reply as well to maybe the fundamental challenge these days is of course when they say such and such let them bring their evidence a challenge that's going on now it's been announced as such is that uh, in particular a missionary group in South Africa but in cooperation with missionary groups all over the world have pointed out what we have to do is convince Muslims that the Quran is no more valuable than the Bible it's interesting how they put it because what they're saying is it's to be admitted that the Bible is a human document, that it contains error and so on. Now we have to convince Muslims the Quran is the same. I don't know why that should make Muslims into Christians, but uh, <laughs> at least what they're trying to say is that we have to show them their book is no better than ours because that has been what the Muslims tried to accentuate. You have these difficulties, I don't have those difficulties. So they're determined to show them. And uh, it, it doesn't work very well, of course, um, but this is what they're busy trying to do. Somebody at a lecture I had uh, given in uh, Minnesota some months ago, he kept corresponding with me, and I was pointing out these difficulties in his sources. And finally he offered, by way of excuse, I guess, he said, look, I've got a book that gives me a lot of mistakes in the Quran. Suppose I showed them to you. Wouldn't you do the same as I do? You'd stick to your religion anyway? Wanda, what would you do if you saw mistakes in the Quran? You point out mistakes to me in the Bible and I stay in my religion. Suppose I showed you these, and he claims he has a book full of them. So I wrote him back to try to show the difference in attitude between us. I said, when you show me an error in the Quran, I will go on a tour and give it a lot of publicity. Encourage him, he can make the arrangements. I'll go from city to city and tell everybody because I care about true and false. I don't excuse it. So then I suggested to him, I said, you pick the error of your choice, pick your favorite one and send it to me. He said, then I will show you, God willing, the kind of scholarship of the people who write these books that you have. So what did he show me? He wrote me that the error is here where it says in the Bible that Zechariah couldn't speak for nine months, but the Quran says he couldn't speak for three days. Now, that's not really an error, of course. <laughs> what he means is his book says this and my book says that. Uh, what I asked for was an error. If he had proof that Zechariah couldn't speak for nine months, I'd be in trouble, yes. But his book says that. My book says something else. What I wrote him back was, in fact, to point out that problem, that this isn't what I asked for. But moreover, that his story doesn't make sense anyway. It's self-contradictory. The Bible tells us Zechariah was a man who had no fault, never did a wrong thing. And yet one day the angel appears to him in the temple where only the high priest can go. He tells him a word and Zechariah thinks that's not an angel, that's the devil. I don't believe that. It doesn't fit in with what we know about Zechariah till then. And... Uh, and so on, you know, just to try to point that out to him. But you see, he hasn't shown me something to disagree on. See, they're in a position of, they tell you, if the Quran is not a revelation, then it is a deception. 
either the prophet was deceived or he himself deceived people. He was a deceiver or a dupe. In either case, the Quran is a deception. It is a lie. And the Muslim wants to insist, if it is a lie, show me a lie. What does it say that you, that you know is wrong? And bring the proof. If you read me this thing, if you tell me, for example, uh, the other example I gave this afternoon <laughs> was um, the Bible tells us when Solomon, Suleiman, was an old man, he worshipped idols. According to the Bible, the Quran says it's not so. That again is a disagreement. Are they going to bring me proof that what I said is incorrect? I can bring them a lot of indications that they're incorrect. There are archaeologists who will tell you in the Encyclopedia Biblica that there was no idol worship in the time of Solomon. So, to kind of sum up so far, what the non-Muslim offers us when we are on the defensive is uh, challenges or suggestions, which are, in one case, unworthy, that is, they are cheap, everybody deserves better than that. They are old arguments which have been answered a long time ago, or they are ill-formed ideas, that is, he said something, he hasn't really thought about what he's saying, when he says something like, you people don't know God, you want to ask him, in what sense don't I know him? I have more names for him than you, than you have, I suppose. I would be the first thing I'd say. They know God is, uh, what, holy and loving and happy, uh, is about the only attributes I can think of in the Bible. Or they bring us suggestions that are ungrounded. Uh, that is, uh, to say, oh, you people have uh, uh, taken your beliefs from mythology or whatever, and yet they can't give an example of that. Or they've given us replies that have no application. That's the kind of thing where somebody says, logic has its limits, and you want to say, have you applied that principle and showed me where I stepped over the limit? No, he didn't think about that. While, on the other hand, what has the Muslim done? Well, he has tried to point out to people that, number one, you have abandoned the methods that bring you success in every other field in your life. Anything else you do in life, when you find something is an impossibility, you start over. You know you made a mistake when you find confusion. Because you prefer the confusion, you have given up the faculty of reasoning. As one of the uh, traditions says, the best thing God ever gave man was his reasoning ability. And instead, you have exercised only your preference. You take what you choose, not what you have a reason to take, it's what you prefer. We have tried to point out that people have lowered their standards. That is, they have smoothed out the obstacles. The natural obstacles, the things that would cause trouble anywhere else. You read the Bible account of the events leading up to the crucifixion of Jesus. It tells us that the man who betrayed him went off and discussed with the high priests, how much will you pay me to betray him? It reports the conversation. They settled on 30 pieces of silver. How did that get in the Bible? Who told the Bible writer this? Judas or the high priest? Who said, oh, by the way, we had a talk, we decided on 30 pieces of silver? Or as you read a little later on, it's reported Jesus told his disciples to stay where they were, and it says he went a long distance away, they fell asleep, and then he prayed, and he said these words. Who heard the words that wrote this down? If that was any other book of history, you'd read that and you'd say, how did this get here? The man doesn't say, Where did, who gave him this? In particular, he does not say, God gave me this. One writer says, I just tried to trace these things with accuracy. But in any history, we insist on knowing when somebody says something, where did you get that? Or it doesn't qualify as history. And the last point that I mentioned was that people fail to specify their excuse. That is, those who would say, uh, your book has lied, and you say, which lie? And he can't tell you specifically. He has only an opinion, but he hasn't supplied the detail. Now, Muslims are challenged. That's maybe what people are more interested in uh, for the last uh, seven years. Uh, I've had the privilege of being challenged. I enjoy the exercise. There's a little book called 90 Difficult Questions for Muslims. Sometimes people come to my lectures with, these, with a little book, a little thing about like that.
And they'll come to me afterwards and say, I want to ask you a question. They bring out the book and they, they find their favorite. And they ask the question, they put the book away. I give them an answer. And they stop. No, wait a minute. When they get the book back, I say, wait, 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 wait. They figure they must have said it wrong. Because somebody told them, ask a Muslim this or any of these questions, he doesn't have an answer. The idea is the people who wrote that book had in mind nobody's really going to ask a Muslim that, I guess. Or if he does, he'll ask somebody who, who can't answer it. Because he, he's not aware of these things or he's not uh, thinking clearly. I can tell you some fascinating stories of the very difficulty that people have got themselves into because they've been self-confident where they had never tested what they thought they had. As uh, Ahmed Didad was telling me some years ago in Durban there was a, a man, I believe it was American or British, but he was a teacher of Arabic. And he used to tease the Muslim students at the university from time to time. He'd throw out some question to them which they didn't know the answer to, and they'd run to Didat and ask him, what do you say to this? He'd tell them something, they'd take it back to him. But Didat kept telling them, invite him to come to me, we'll sit. Just tell him, we'll come to my home, we'll have tea, let him bring his questions to me, not to you. We'll talk about these things. The man would never come. Then one day, he was in some place where this teacher appeared. Didat was sitting there having tea man had no excuse. He waved him over. He says, come here, sit down. He says, I've been wanting to talk to you. So the man sat down and he said to him, hey, <laughs> there was no sense in wasting time. He spoke to him directly. He says, I understand you're very fluent in Arabic, so I wonder why aren't you a Muslim by now? So the man said, do you have a copy of the Quran? I'll show you. So he found the ayah and he read to him the ayah that gives the complaint where Iblis complains to Allah. He says, you've caught me in the wrong. He says, you see there, I can't believe in a God who would deceive someone. He tricked Iblis. That's what Iblis says. So Didat pointed out to him, said in the first place, this is Iblis that's talking. He says, he complains, Allah, you tricked me. He said, you believe that? I mean, the devil says the God lies, that's good enough for you? On the other hand, Didat says to him, in the Bible, God says he's the liar. Here the devil calls God a liar, but God says he'll do the lying in the Bible. The man got very upset. He said, no, where is this? And as fast as he told him, it's a story everybody knows. Because it reports how it says, God spoke to Moses and he said, go to Pharaoh and warn him. Tell him if he doesn't release my people, I will punish him in this way and that way and so on. Tell him that. Warn him that he has no choice but to let them go or I will punish him. Warn him, but I will harden his heart so he won't listen to your warning. That's deception. Then go ahead and warn him, but I won't let him listen to you. I'll harden his heart so he will refuse to hear the warning. He says at this point, the man got up and he turned and he walked away. And it, he was saying, no, come back, we haven't finished. You haven't finished your tea. He said the man never even turned around. He just... Straight away, never even turned around and looked at him. But I would wager you, if it was, I mean, it would seem to me to be a safe bet, because I've known it to happen, the man will use the same argument someplace else later on. Because I've seen that kind of thing happen. Now, I usually try to be, is that the, the advice given to people is, you, you deal kindly with people. But the Quran makes a distinction between the ordinary man and the leaders of unbelief. You deal with them in different ways. There is a man named Ernie Hahn, who has a heads up this Muslim fellowship of uh, faith, uh, fellowship of faith, which is meant to evangelize Muslims in Toronto. It was about three, four years ago. He came to a talk that I gave, and he asked afterwards. He said, "There's a serious contradiction in the Quran, where it says in this ayah, the Jews bragged we killed the Messiah." He says the Jew wouldn't say that. They were waiting for the Messiah. They wouldn't say we killed the Messiah. So it was pointed out to him that uh, the Quran also says the Meccans used to come to the Muslims and say to them, uh, you to whom the revelation came, uh, tell us a thing. They didn't believe they really had a revelation, it was sarcasm. It was pointed out to him that the Bible says that the Jews stood there and looked at Jesus being crucified and said to him, save yourself, Messiah, in sarcasm. 
it's hard to imagine that the, uh, there weren't at least two Jews that walked home that afternoon saying, hey, we killed the Messiah. Big laugh. That's what's being talked about. That's what Tafsir tells you about that ayah, which he knows very well. But he wants to insist this is an argument. So, sometime later, a couple of years later, one of his students came to a talk I gave. And he was having discussion with me afterwards, and he said, you know, there's a serious problem in the Koran where it says, and he gives me this argument. And I said, you heard that argument from Ernie Hahn. Two years ago, he told it to me. I told him this. When I gave him the reply, he put out his hand. You want to shake my hand? He says, okay, I'll give you that. That's not a very good argument, is it? He wanted to give me that. His student recognizes that's not a good argument. Another year went by. It was last fall. And uh, the man was giving a talk near Toronto, Waterloo. And uh, it was a question period. And when I put up my hand, I, uh, I just mentioned that very thing. I said, this is your forum. You can do what you want. If you gave me one minute, I would prove to these people you're a liar. But you don't have to. Now, that's... I don't usually speak that way, but the man has spent three years lying. It's time he's named for what he is. That's why people didn't like Jesus. All the reports go because he pointed to people in the audience and said, this one has led you astray, this one is a liar, this one is a snake, and so on. So he was quite flustered. He said, oh, go ahead. So I repeated what I just told you about his student, how he granted me the argument, so on and so forth. He didn't like that very much at all. He, he says, well, I still say a, a Jew would never say we killed the Messiah. At which point, <laughs> there was a man sitting here that put up his hand. And he said, well, last week there was a rabbi in this room and he gave a talk about Judaism and Christianity. And I asked him when the talk was over, what do you say about the Messiah? He laughed and he said, well, this is a big problem with Jews and Christians because we Jews, we killed the Messiah. So how much more proof do you want? But a Jew won't say this, or will say it, and you insist that he won't. I had a little thing I had in this case until it fell apart, uh, the uh, little slip of paper somebody had handed in one time that said, uh, I suppose you think there are no contradictions in the Koran. What do you say about this? And it gave me, it gave me two references, surah number, ayah number, surah number, ayah number saying in this place it says Allah does not guide the, uh, the wrongdoers and in this place Allah guides whom he chooses so you see the contradiction is that a contradiction it tells me he chooses not to guide the wrongdoers is what it tells me Allah guides whom he chooses he does not guide the wrongdoers is not a contradiction the one fits with the other but the tragedy is that the person who submitted that as a question is not somebody who read 6,100 and some ayat of the Koran and found this one and found this one and made a note of it. You know very well somebody put that in his hand. Somebody said to him, you going to a talk tonight? The Muslims are giving here. You, there you are. You see, you don't even have to bother going. This is a mistake in the Koran. The, the tragedy is that people take that. They trust people like that. Who, if he really thought it was a mistake, the man who wrote that thought it was a mistake, he's mentally unfit to be a teacher in the first place, more likely he knew it wasn't a mistake but hoped it would fool somebody in which case he shouldn't be a teacher either because he's used to dealing in things that aren't true a couple more examples of things i guess i can give you but I, but I hope you you see that it's not a matter of you have to know a lot of things to reply to people you just have to be thinking clearly you don't lose arguments because of something you didn't know somebody tells you something you didn't know now you know it if you're clear-headed, you give it back to him. It's his problem, not yours. You had the truth to start with. A frequent comment made is people will say, well, you reject what you don't understand. That's how you do business. You don't believe God is a trinity because you don't understand trinity. That's why you reject it. To which I ask them, how does trinity work? Can you explain it to me? And they'll reply, well, no one understands it. So they're problem is they're insisting that I've rejected something that I don't understand and their complaint is you see if you just hear more about it everything would be different you just you've heard something and you don't like it but when you push on this matter to say well then you explain it to me they'll tell you well no one can understand it so what he thought was my problem is his problem too nobody understands it by definition but in fact the Muslim doesn't reject things he doesn't understand he rejects things that there's no indication of 
There's a lot of things we don't understand, but we know they're true because we have indications of them. We can see these things. We don't know how atoms work and combine, but we know that they combine. You put hydrogen and oxygen together, you get water. I've seen it happen. I don't know how it works. I don't reject it because I don't understand it. I can see it. People try to parallel that, as a man said to me in Australia. He says, you can't explain God, so why should you expect to explain the Trinity? Well, it's different. God, I can verify. Lots of indications. Trinity, I've never seen anything that told me there was such a thing. It's not a fair comparison. It was, I've only done it once, but by way of a, it just occurred to me one time to do it. It was at Texas A&M University last year. We started the talk at 8 o'clock. When I started in, it just as I started to speak, it occurred to me, so I said it. I said, we advertised a lecture at 8, questions at 9. There are people who won't come here till 9 o'clock because they don't think I have the answers to these questions. I gave the questions and gave the answers. I said, they'll be here at 9 to ask those questions because they don't think I have the answers. They won't bother coming until question period time. Came 9 o'clock, and sure enough, the first man stepped up the microphone. He said, I'm sorry I couldn't be here at 8 o'clock, but I wonder, could you have answered this question? And it was question number one. He referred to John 3.16, a favorite verse. Everybody laughed. He won't know what's a joke. We thought something's going on behind him. So I mentioned to him, well, I did touch on that subject, and I gave this answer. Oh. He said, yes, but I'm sure you couldn't have answered this one. And here was number two. Now everybody really laughed. And he looked around and wondered, maybe he thought he had a hole in his pants or something. He thought, what are they laughing at behind me? So then I told him, I said, you and your self-confidence think you know, so you don't bother to find out. You come to make trouble instead of listening ahead of time. It, it had an effect on, uh, on people because we may feel confident, but we've got to test that confidence all our lives. We try it here and there. We can't just stand firm on some thing and think, I don't ever need to hear another fact. Test it. Keep looking. Does anybody have anything better? Can he reply to you better than the last man? Keep thinking. That way you correct your course. I suppose I can come back to some of these things to try to illustrate the difficulties again. Remember that in making your position, whether you're reasoning on something or you're pointing out some facts, that people will usually try to make you say something you didn't say. If, for example, you try to be reasonable, if you use the Aryan syllogism, if you say to somebody, look, if a man, if this man was God, uh, then he didn't die, in which case he wasn't really a man. And people will tell you, you're limiting God. That yes, it's impossible that one person can be God and man at the same time, but God can do anything and he could make it true anyway. That's not what you're doing. You're not limiting. This is a self-defeating proposition. That is, if it's true that one individual is both God and man, it will lead you to the conclusion that it's false. It defeats itself. It has nothing to do with the limitation of ability for someone to force it to be true. This is the assumption that God has a son will lead you to the conclusion that he doesn't have a son. It's self-defeating. This is, I say, words people try to put in your mouth to make it seem like you've said something you haven't said. Somebody told me was it only yesterday about a story from India about a man who... Uh, was in a discussion, a debate with a missionary, a Muslim in a debate, and uh, he put him on. I guess he fooled him. He, at one point, he somebody came to the the Muslim. He whispered something to him, and he made a sad face. And the missionary wanted to know what's wrong. He said, "The man just told me that Jibril died." And uh, the missionary says, "Don't be silly. An angel can't die." He says, "But you tell me God died." <laughs> you see, it's easy to keep saying things, but we don't think about the meaning of it. And then what he did by that tactic is he points out to a man, have you ever thought about the words you say and what they mean? You can say it so often that you, you forget what it is those words mean. Because what do they mean? That's what 
as I think I mentioned last night, Spinoza complained about 500 years ago when the, he left the Jewish community and the Christians came running to him and said, well, now you should be a Christian. You're an intelligent man. And Spinoza, all his life, he said, if I knew what you people were talking about, I might be. You tell me God became a man. What do you mean? Do you mean like when water becomes ice? That God is one kind of a thing and then one day he squeezed himself down into a man? Is that what you mean? God became man? Uh, do you mean he used to be God, now he's a man? Is that what you mean? What do you mean when you say that? It's words, but does it have any sense to it? What do you mean if you say Jesus died, but he's God? Do you mean it like... Uh, some lizards have this ability that if a, a falcon will catch the lizard by the tail, the tail breaks off and the lizard runs away and the tail will sit there and twitch for a while and finally die. Is that what you mean? That God was a man and at the last moment as he was killed, he got away and the body died, but he didn't really die. Is that what you mean? Because they don't. I tell you, no, that would be, uh, that would be cheating because he really died. He had to die. It's not like he just stepped out and left the body behind. But then they can't say what they do mean. In fact, it may sound funny, but that's exactly how some church authorities put it. They'll tell you that, till now, we are trying to decide who died on the cross. They don't mean they think it was the wrong man or something, like the Muslims might say. They mean, who was it that died? It was Jesus, but that if he was a man and he died, we can understand that, but that wouldn't be good enough. But then God doesn't die. Who was it anyway? They're still talking about it after all these centuries. Now, of course, and this is what one priest stressed to me in Ireland, and it was the result, I, I feel, anyway, of a, a recent document, I have a copy in here, uh, of an ecumenical group that had published a statement in the UK on the subject of mysteries of faith, saying that, yes, these things are real problems. To say God died really is trouble. But they say this is a mystery. It is a bold proclamation of a truth which already is a contradiction in terms. Mystery, at least in English, it comes from the word new, which is an imitation of one man whispering to another, new, a mystery, a thing you kept secret, not a thing you announced. But I tell you, a mystery is a truth. But the complaint is, it doesn't make any sense. And I say, that's the nature of it. It's such a big truth, you can't look at it. It's like looking at the sun. You have to turn your eyes away. It will blind you. But the fallacy in that analogy is that it's not my eye that tells me about the sun necessarily. There are blind men who know all about the sun. You don't need an eye to know it's there. There's lots of ways to establish the sun is there without looking at it. But they're telling you that a mystery is a truth. But you only have one faculty, one organ that can see truth, your mind. And they tell you, well, your mind can't look at it. See, if the sun was a thing that could only be detected by means of the eyeball, and none of us had eyeballs, then no one could insist you must believe in the sun. It wouldn't be fair. Say, I have no way to know if it's there. For someone to say, you must believe this is true, but I have no way of looking at it with that organ that sees truth, how can this be a fundamental article of my faith, something I must believe, because I can't believe it. I can promise to say it, but I don't believe it. I've never seen it, or seen any indication of it. I never, just as the sun, I may not have seen it, but I feel its warmth. I know there's something there. A mystery is a thing that's true and it has no indications. There's other philosophical difficulties. I don't know how much of it you may have heard in other talks when I've been through here. Uh, but again, these are Quranic principles to point out that we should think about what we say. If we say, God adopts a son, God produced a son, that neither one of these are meaningful. Could a man adopt a dog as a son? He could fill out all the papers. Some people do. They put it in the newspaper as a joke. The man said, I filled out all the legal forms. The dog has his own bedroom. He has a scholarship to university. I set a place for him at the table. The dog is my son. And they write it up in the newspaper so we can all laugh at a crazy man. Because 
A dog is a different thing than a man. It's not meaningful. A dog can't act like a son. He can only act like a dog. It's too big a difference, man to dog. In the same way, how can God take a man as a son? There's too big a difference. A man could be treated like a son, I suppose, but can he act like a son? There's nothing in him divine. He's not divine. So they solve the problem and they say, well, when God adopts us as sons, he gives us a little bit of divinity, a little spark of divinity. We're, we're like him. We share his nature just a little bit without realizing that divinity is a thing you don't share. When you say divinity, it's not a thing you get. It's not an achievement. It's not an acquisition. Divinity is a condition by which you've always been divine. You don't get there. Divinity means priority. Who is God is the owner because there was nobody before him. That's why he's the owner. He has priority. Anybody else might reach for these things, but he was there first. In a similar way, he does not produce a son because to produce something, that is a son, is a derived item. But a son has to be like his father. So the son of God has to be unproduced because that's what his father is like. That's why the, it's a self-defeating proposition. If you say that one is the son of God, he resembles his father. In fact, he doesn't have a father, just like his father. So he's nobody's son. There's no such individual, lam yeled wa lam yuled, as the ayah says. There's more direct things, as I say, speaking of details. Somebody mentioned just the other day this very point that if you talk about the Bible to people, they'll tell you, uh, you're quoting out of context. That's a favorite phrase they use. I think some people say they don't know what it means. Quoting out of context, and what they mean is you, you took that thing off the page, you didn't look at what came before and after it. That's the accusation made. That's how some people wrote the Bible. They quote it out of context. Matthew chapter 2 tells a story of Jesus saying when he was a young man his family ran away to Egypt so that the scripture would be fulfilled which said out of Egypt I called my son and he quotes from Hosea chapter 11 verse 1 if you look up that verse you find out he quoted half a sentence the full sentence is not talking about God's son it's talking about the nation of Israel it says when Israel was a youth I loved him out of Egypt I called my son in other words he treated Israel like a son called the nation out of Egypt. And people say, oh yes, but this Israel, that means Jesus. It was a picture of Jesus. Is it? They should keep reading. The next verse says, but every time I called him, he turned instead and worshipped idols. That's what the next verse says. So how can that possibly be applied to Jesus? But whoever wrote Matthew did, because he quoted out of context to make his point. The same Matthew who will tell you that 40 one divided by three equals fourteen in the beginning of his book. He gives a list of forty-one names and tells you they fall into three groups of fourteen. He's missing a name somewhere. You can find out which name it is because there's another list drawn up in another place. Which means there's a problem here. There's, something isn't accurate. Maybe that's a warning to us that we shouldn't insist on the accuracy of the book because here's an obvious mistake. So in summary, going by experiences that I've had, the things I've tried to outline here, whether people have embarrassed themselves by the foolish things they've said, or whether uh, people have uh, come to confusion and been happy about it, they've rejoiced in it, or whether you have seen sources which confuse themselves, as I just mentioned, the point is that people have misplaced their trust in sources or other people or in themselves. They've listened to people who were ill-informed or who were well-informed but dishonest or they listen to themselves who have become informed and remain dishonest with themselves. It's the... Uh, there's many heartwarming stories that I've heard of people and, and met for myself that have chosen Islam because they decided to be honest with themselves. There's a friend of mine that told me not that long ago, he was in Europe, and he met a uh, Muslima. She had been a Catholic nun, and she was now working as a ho in a hospital. She had training as a nurse, and he was a doctor. And he asked her, that, uh, how was it that uh, she chose Islam anyway, when she was a, had been a nun for many years? And she said one day she just 
was honest enough to say to herself what she knew was the truth. She said, the more we knew about our religion, the more confused we got. And realize that's not how I achieve success in anything else in life. If you're going to school and you're getting more confused every day, then you're taking the wrong subject, more likely there's something wrong with your teacher. Uh, the point is, that's not how education is supposed to work. You learn more so you get rid of the confusion. You get more accurate and you know it better. You don't sacrifice accuracy for the sake of understanding. The more you know, the less confused. So if you find yourself getting more confused the more you hear, probably you're pointing in the wrong direction. There's even a verse uh, from the Bible that says, God is not the author of confusion. So I guess I have taken much longer than we uh, had in mind even, uh, but I thank you again for your uh, time and attention. I'm always uh, glad to have the chance to uh, pass through here and share some uh, ideas with you. Alhamdulillah. Oh, yes, I don't know what the circumstances are. What is it? The topic of it? Islam and Christianity concerns scriptures. Yeah. Well, uh, we thank Brother Gary for a beautiful lecture tonight. And before we start question time, we'll have a small announcement to make, which is uh, tomorrow in Abu Dhabi, there'll be a lecture in the Adnok Lecture Hall, which is under the title of uh, Islam and Christianity. And uh, I think it starts at 8.30. So if anybody has a question, please raise your hand and uh, the lecturer will go ahead and answer it, I guess. Don't be shy. Go ahead. Yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> well, there's not a great deal that's spelled out. Uh, because um, he's asking about the position of women in Christianity. Uh, there's not a great deal that's spelled out because you don't really have a code of law that's set down in that you have a code of law from that the, the Jews have had all these years, but basically the, the majority of Christianity would say, yes, but we set that aside. We, we don't need that. We don't go by those guidelines. That's, that's old-fashioned. We have another way of looking at it. Uh, but then the frustration is there's not very much set down by way of an outline. The only comments that I can recall that are ever made about women in any method of saying this is their place, this is what they should do, and so on, are by Paul, who was a, frankly, seems to be a misogynist. He hated women. He said it was because of women that sin came into the world. Uh, in fact, he gave a recommendation. He says, better a man should never even marry. He said, but if you're weak, go ahead. He says, you must. Uh, better you shouldn't. Uh, he says, I don't uh, allow a woman to speak in front of a man. She should keep her head covered, so that uh, as a sign of submission to her husband. Uh, some comments like that that are very unfortunate, which is why you have a great dispute now over where there are women trying to take the lead in some uh, churches, and people react against that and say, yes, but what would Paul say? He'd be very shocked at this. Um, and yet at the same time, there are, there are women reported through writings of the book of Acts after the time of Jesus who were well respected in the community. So if you see that the difficulty is probably Christians didn't treat women badly, but if they want to stick to their authorities, the only pronouncements on the subject of women they have come from a man who didn't think very much of women and stressed that that was not part of the religion anyway. He stressed this is my opinion. As, it, as far as it, when it came to marriage, for example, he says, God didn't tell me what to say about this, but I'll give you my opinion. You're better off not to get married. So uh, it becomes a wide open kind of a thing, I guess. <laughs> you say, what's the position in Christianity? There's no Christian source because the only thing that comments on it, the man begins by saying, but this isn't what God said. It's just what I'd prefer. And if people would imitate that in spite of that uh, uh, demand, then they're putting women in an unfortunate position. That's maybe an oversimplification, but it's sure it's a very big subject right now. Um, trying to think of what other. Yeah, the only other reference I can think of to that is uh, 
the reporter Jesus made a serious comment about divorce. He was saying how the Jews treated it very carelessly. He said that, that you, you divorce uh, without sufficient reason and so on, that you should be more careful, that the only legitimate grounds are these, and so that he uh, tried to patch up the arrangement, which seems like a positive move. You see, that's not the negativism of, of Paul. Um, yeah, how did he put it? He said, better to marry than to burn. That's what it was. I said, if you can't stand it, if you're burning up, then get married. He said, Otherwise, you're better off not to. It's better to marry than to burn. <laughs> yes, well, that's... That's, that's offered sometimes as an objection, but it's kind of funny when people do that because they don't know their own background. Uh, I always ask people, uh, so how many uh, wives can a Christian man have? And of course they'll tell you, only one. Then you want to ask them, does it say that someplace in your, your book? Because it doesn't. And history will tell you that it wasn't the case anyway. What you will find, even in Paul's writings again, he recommends, he says, if a man wants to take charge of a group of people, if he wants to be a bishop, let him restrict himself to one wife. Says he's going to be so busy, as he is trying to say, my advice is, if he's going to be an overseer, a bishop, he should have one wife. Uh, the historical realities are that up until 300 years ago, even, that was well known, the Lutheran Church encouraged men to take more than one wife after the uh, warfare of 300 years ago had so lowered the male population. So when King Henry VIII wanted to divorce his wife, and the church said, no, you can't, his own spiritual advisors, the priests, told him, don't divorce her. But this other one you want to marry? Marry her. The church won't be able to say anything about it. You will have them on a technicality because they don't have a law that says you can't have more than one wife. Instead, he broke with the church and divorced her. But the, what I'm getting at is the idea of monogamy is a tradition. It's not part of the religion. It was never part of Judaism, for that matter. The Jewish law, I believe, was something that was five wives for an ordinary man, 18 for the king. That's how the law was actually set down, or it became set down in rabbinical Judaism from the Talmud. Uh, in Islam, of course, there's a great deal of qualification to that. That must be abused by some people, I suppose. But uh, it's set down with some qualifications. It's evidently there to solve a problem. It's not to uh, give wide open permission. In fact, the place which talks about four, marrying four, the ayah is talking about widows and orphans. Evidently, what's under discussion right there is solving the problem of widows and orphans. Maybe what you ought to do is marry them. You see, so it's, a, it's, a, it's much more than just some kind of a blanket permission in Islam, which is what people are generally not aware of. And, uh, but you do best in replying to that or any other question not to tell somebody how good it is. Somebody says, look, you people can have more than one wife. You don't want to say, yes, that's good because... He doesn't want to hear that. You have to start a step before that and tell him, do you say something different? You have to make him realize maybe his challenge isn't worth very much. Then maybe they'll come along and ask you, why do you do that anyway? Now you can tell him he was ready to hear what are the benefits of this. Okay. Yes? Well, <laughs> of course it's literal, but uh, that, that's just it. You see, that's a, uh, an artificial distinction that is found in uh, when people start talking about the Bible. Uh, they'll tell quite a story because it, it says something like, uh, you know, God walked in the garden, he made noise when he walked, and he called Adam, where are you, and so on. It becomes a very uh, uh, funny-sounding uh, thing, so they say, well, this must have an allegorical interpretation because God doesn't walk and make noise with his feet and, and, and so on when he walks, so this is allegorical, but you don't have that problem in the Quran. It tells you that mankind is made of a single nafs, literal enough. Your problem might be in making it too literal to say, what does this nafs mean? could mean nothing more than a single kind because mythology was, uh, in many areas will tell you that men and women are uh, men and women are different creatures they come from different places the Quran tells you no no men and women they come from each other they're one kind one nafs 
Uh, to be more specific than that, uh, you know, maybe then you cross into being too literal. In other words, you, you force more out of the words than is there. So it's not exactly the division that you're <laughs> talking about. So is it allegorical? Is it literal? It's literal. But you can insist, and then you would exceed your authority to say these words mean more than they actually say, that it happened like this. As, for example, the ayah saying the one was made from the other, if you tended to follow the biblical story, which said, yes, a rib was taken from Adam and made into a woman. Well, the Quran doesn't say that. It says the one came from the other. That, that's all. <laughs> you see, stop here. If you start spelling out details, then, then you become much too literal. What it says of the creation of uh, Adam, what it says of the creation of Isa, is what it says of the creation of every man. We're made of the same thing. Allah says the word, there we are. The details, how that happens, that's his business, not ours, unless he had spelled it out somehow. Just leave him with that. Uh, there's a lot of things of that, that nature, whether you're talking about crucifixion or creation or the uh, conception of Jesus or whatever, we shouldn't step past what the Quran says. We may have a pretty good idea, the indication may be very sound that you suspect it's like this, but if it doesn't say so, leave it. Probably you're right. Don't make it. It's what uh, Ismail Faruqi, an uh, uh, American uh, writer in Philadelphia, has called Israelitisms. That Muslims have very often fallen into the trap of, they read something in the Quran and the details are not specific, so they say, well, what do the Jews believe? Oh, well, that must be what it is. And they fill in the details from <laughs> what he called Israelitisms. They take them from here. The Quran says the one was made from the other. Oh, it's a rib from Adam, yes, and they <laughs> carry this over, and that's what we should be aware of doing. That, uh, that, of course, is what has to be identified as a problem to them, if you can. And that, that's, uh, I know Muslims uh, very often uh, meet uh, foreign students in the U.S. and Canada. They become so frustrated they, with discussions they have with people. They say, I show him how this doesn't make sense, and he smiles. Because he says, yes, I know. <laughs> Isn't it wonderful? Uh, he's been conditioned that it shouldn't make sense. That the that idea that, that that's how religion is supposed to work. Uh, what uh, you have to point out to them, uh, if at all possible, is what they're doing. You know, to uh, to not only reason with them but point out to them. So why is it you don't respond? Have you ever wondered that? Why don't you respond? Why doesn't it move you to action? Uh, because under any other circumstance, if any other subject was under discussion, you would move to action. You would correct yourself. So maybe they re-examine their, their motives. I think that's, uh, that uh, it occurred to me uh, the other day in uh, doing some recording here, that exactly parallels the uh, activity of Muslims down through the century. That their message has always been to people, you shouldn't be satisfied with what you have, you deserve better. And in kindness, you're trying to tell a man, look at yourself, aren't you ashamed? I mean, you know, in one way or another, aren't you embarrassed? Uh, we were trying to think, some of us the other day, and maybe somebody here remembers the name of the, the uh, idol worshiper in uh, Medina, back the, the, just after uh, Hijra, that uh, some boys used to come and steal his idol every night, and he got so fed up with going to find the idol the next morning, and one night he put the sword in front of the idol. He said, when they come for you tonight, defend yourself. And the next morning his idol was gone. And he found it in a garbage pit tied around the neck of a dog. So he was down in his stomach, reaching down in the garbage pit, trying to untie his idol from the neck of the dog. And one of the Muslims came by and saw him down there and called him by name, which name I can't remember, and said to him, look at yourself. Down in the garbage, getting your God away from the, the dirt. Don't you deserve better than that? You're a man. Aren't you worthy of more than that? You, you can exactly parallel that kind of thing if you, uh, I would hope gently but firmly, <laughs> to show people that thing, that you, telling them you've become satisfied with something that you shouldn't be satisfied with. You deserve better than that. And what had occurred to me the other day was uh, of how it reminded me of that story of, uh, of how it said that they used to find Omar from time to time Muslims would find him all by himself and he'd be laughing and asking, what's so funny? 
He said, I was just remembering how when I was ignorant, I used to make an idol out of dates, and I'd worship it, and then I'd eat it. You see, at some point in his life, that, you know, that mind had to look once more new at everything again. You know, just what he had taken for granted and done for a long time, suddenly he, it was like he closed his eyes and he looked again and saw the value of it. So I guess it's that kind of shock therapy that you're trying to do to people to tell them that you've got all my argument down cold. Now, if you just blink once and look again, shouldn't it surprise you? Can't you step outside of your familiar mode of behavior? In fact, there's one a person that observed, and I think it's a valid comment. He said, when, usually when people think, they travel along the well-worn paths, that is, the, the familiar highways. They're used to thinking in a certain way, so no matter what you give them, even if it's something you never heard of before, they're determined to bend it until it fits on the, their usual way of thinking, and then they, they carry on where they were. They don't try and explore new territory. You tell them, you know, over there where you never looked before is something surprising, and they'll try and bring it over here somehow. It's a, it's a human failing. Well, I say, in one way or another, a person has to somehow uh, shock people into being objective. That was the point of that story of uh, the man saying, uh, I just heard the news that the angel, Gabriel, Jibril has, Jibril has died. And people laugh at that until you said, but look, that's exactly, like, that's worse than what you said a minute ago. You said God died. So that somehow you, you've made him see once more what he, he's quite familiar with, but he looked at it with a new perspective. Which is, uh, I mean, yes, it's not uh, always necessary to uh, hurt people. Sometimes uh, I suppose it can't be helped, but uh, it can happen that sometimes what somebody has told you you ought to do is not something you have to do anyway. I don't know specifically the exact details, but I'm thinking in terms of... Uh, my wife's grandmother was 88 years old and due to die any day when my wife accepted Islam. Now, she covered herself. Her, her grandmother is dying out of her mind nearly anyway. She thought if she sees me dressed like this, she's going to be shocked. So when she went in to visit her grandmother before she went in the room, she took this thing off her head. So her mother would say, what happened to you, you see? Because who says she has to go and upset her grandmother the day before she dies when she's half out of her mind anyway? with something that's going to frighten her. Better she might say a nice thing to her grandmother, say, what, you know, what are you thinking about now? Set her mind at ease in some way. Um, although there are some, I, I knew a young man in Toronto who was, his parents literally would kill him if they knew he was a Muslim. And yet the Muslim students around there were saying, you've got to go to your parents and tell them that you're a Muslim. He doesn't even live with them. They live a long ways away. So you've got to go there today and tell them this. What for? So they can kill him? I guess, you know, that, that is, uh, I'm sure that's an extreme case, but that's how you might have been put in that position. Some people will insist on something they have no right to insist on, and I don't know the details there. But, uh, so, if you're looking for advice, ask a lot of people. <laughs> don't take the first piece of advice somebody tells you. Somebody may insist on something that, and they don't know the, the full story. <laughs> well, as I say, I don't know all the details. That requires some some discussion. Yeah, oh, well, uh, what I'm getting at is, for example, if you're visiting with your... Uh, well, of course, you might be surprised, too. Uh, I'd only recommend. I knew a young American who uh, who's, uh, thought his... Uh, oh, oh, all right. Yeah. Yes. Well, anyway, as I say, I, you might be surprised, but I think if you think you know the mind of somebody. Uh, I, I knew a, a young man who uh, uh, was talking about Islam to his sister, and his grandmother overheard him, and she turned on him and said, how can you say that? So he thought, uh, now I'm really in trouble. I've upset my grandmother. But he explained to her what he meant, and she said, oh, I see your point. She accepted Islam. Was a Muslim for four years until she died, and her family made life miserable for her until she died. You never know. You never know. Don't, you know, be so sure. Uh, and there's people here can probably tell you similar stories. Uh, I just heard one the other day of somebody who no one would ever guess this would be the last person who'd ever turned to Islam that they did. That was one thing to keep in mind before you form judgments, you think you know what's in somebody's mind. The other point is that 
if you're in your family's home, you don't have to cover yourself anyway. So uh, I have to know exactly in what are the circumstances. I mean, is it a matter of you leave their home and they follow you down the street to see if you covered yourself or, or, or what? Is it, Oh, you know, that's that's a tiny piece of it, really. That's not the real, that's not the real background for that. That's a, it's supposed to be a mark of, a, uh, for one thing, a mark of dignity to a, a, a woman that says she doesn't have to advertise what she's uh, not selling. Uh, it has nothing to, well, it has very little to do with the idea that men are such animals they have to be protected from looking at women. That that may be a part of it, but that's very little to do with it, really. That's because uh, <laughs> I don't think men are like that, but <laughs> that some may be, but. That's not the point of it. Women are not covered to help men from out of their difficulties. Uh, it's uh, something that's supposed to do some good for the woman, and it may be an aid to the man, but the point is what it does for, for women. Um, and that's a, that's a story maybe that isn't appreciated. I, say, I, I probably do better if instead of in front of a lot of people talk about exactly that issue and find out what has been said to your parents. You see, what can happen is they may not understand, but they may be brought to understand that what it is you're trying to do by behaving in an Islamic way is to improve yourself, that in fact you're aiming for the same things they want by different means. They would like to achieve the same things that uh, Islam achieves by this practice. They might want to do it some other way, or maybe they don't know how they could do it. And if they can finally appreciate but your goal is the same as theirs, you're trying to do it differently, they might encourage that. This, my wife's parents were very upset with her for a long time. Thought she'd lost her mind. But little by little they came to understand why did she do this. She mentioned to her father one day that she thought she might like to get a job during the summer. And he said, how are you going to get a job unless you show your employer some shape? And as fast as he said it, he realized, what am I saying? And that was the day it made a difference to him. He said, listen to me. I'm telling my daughter, <laughs> show your shape so you can get a job. He didn't talk about that anymore. He suddenly realized what he'd said and realized what it was she was trying to do was maybe a better thing than he was against. But he didn't clarify that till he heard himself say it. And that had reached down to a period of time now where uh, not too long ago, somebody, uh, or my wife's mother, had... Uh, asked her one afternoon when she was staying at their home. She said, the sun is almost set. Don't you have a prayer you're supposed to do before the sun sets? My wife said, oh, there's still time. She said, well, you don't want to miss it, do you? Now, that's a big change over a period of a few years because it, it sunk in that it's not a matter if she's done something strange. It's a matter if she's trying to do what I think is a good thing in the results. She may be doing it differently so that people can come to an appreciation of that. And maybe if you could tell the story better as to why it is the Muslim women do as they do, they might realize that, well, that is a solution to a problem that I know exists, and maybe they can appreciate what you're trying to do. So, like, I can, uh, because I don't know the details there, I can only give you what parallels to that. As a, uh, when I was here in January in Abu Dhabi, a Lebanese man at the hospital there, a Christian, said he wanted to be a Muslim, and, but he wanted these, uh, some advice. He said, what shall I tell my parents? I said, tell them you're trying to be a better Christian. That when you do the things Muslims do, you already, I'll give them three examples, are following the example of Jesus, which they have neglected. So maybe they'll see it in that light. That you didn't turn against this, you tried to do more of the good thing. That you are trying to be a better follower of Jesus. It may seem strange to say that therefore makes you a Muslim, but maybe that's the way it works. Okay? I guess you've got to outline goals for people uh, instead of details. Yeah, yeah actually, that's, that's the other thing. that You'd be surprised that it doesn't always cause trouble. It does sometimes. It depends on what you wear. They'll tell you in, in London, if you want to wear a shador, the, the Iranian kind of thing, yes, you're asking for trouble to go out on the street. People recognize that. If you dress Islamically, that is, you follow guidelines but not styles, most people won't even recognize you. My wife got on a bus one time and a man looked at her and he, he said, good afternoon, sister. Thought she was a nun. She was nine months pregnant. I don't know what it was. 
don't know what he was thinking of, but he just thought, well, that's very nice. Because it doesn't, it doesn't cause the difficulties every time that people think it does. It causes the difficulty if you assault people. There are, man, I know in San Francisco that uh, virtually every week somebody comes to Islam because of his invitation, uh, that is through him, and yet the Tablik brothers, they wanted to know, why is it that we don't get that response? So he said, well, come with me, watch what I do. And he approaches people, he talks about Islam. They approach people, people find an excuse, they run away. Why? Because they come, they look like something, they look like they're ready to... They rode off the screen Lawrence of Arabia or something, you see? It frightens people. Because they come with a full gear, and all that people see is a strangeness, and they back away. So you can follow Islamic guidelines without necessarily imitating a precise style. You can still satisfy all the requirements. Then you've set people at ease. In other words, you could cover yourself Islamically and really not... In fact, it's a funny thing, I wish I had a picture of it. In Toronto, there's a, an ad at all the bus stops, or many of the bus stops, about a fashion magazine. And it has a picture of a woman in the latest fashion, and it's hijab. That's the latest style. I mean, it's the whole thing, this whole piece like this. It's, it's a thing that will come and go, no doubt, in a period of a few years or something. But right now, that's high fashion. You want to look rich and elegant, you dress like that. You see, so it's hard to imagine now, at least in Toronto, how you uh, would cause some trouble or how you'd make even your family feel bad if you dressed Islamically, because right now that's high fashion. That's uh, what the people will be very excited to see the clothes my wife got from here, because that happens to be what people want there. Okay. Is that all the time we have? Yeah. Okay. Yes, thank you again. Alhamdulillah.